Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Drew Dameron, and I'm the library here, library manager here at the Tokyo American Club. For tonight's Tech Talk, we're very happy to be hosting speaker and club member Dr. Greg Story, a PhD in Japanese decision making and a 36 year veteran of Japan. He has broad experience having launched a startup in Nagoya and completed turnarounds in both Osaka and Tokyo for Austrade. In 2001, he was promoted to Minister Commercial in the Australian Embassy and the Country Head for Austrade. In November 2003, Dr. Story joined Shinsei's Retail Bank, which interestingly was a special combination of startup and turnaround. He had 550 staff in his Platinum Banking Division, responsible for two-thirds of the revenue of the Retail Bank, eventually becoming the joint CEO of the Retail Bank. In July 2007, Dr. Story became the country head for the National Australia Bank in Japan, and in October 2010, he took over as president of the Dale Carnegie Training Japan. Despite COVID, the business ranked global number eight in revenues in 2020. He is an adjunct professor in the International Business Faculty of Griffith University and a sixth don in traditional Shitoryu Karate. He applies martial art philosophies and strategies to business issues. We'll start tonight's event with Dr. Story's presentation, and then we'll open it up for Q&A from those attending in person and virtually, from which we're expecting about 14. For those of you online, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions, and I'll be sure to pass them on to our speaker when it's appropriate. After this Q&A, we'll have a book sale and signing here at the table to close out the event. Those attending virtually may also purchase a book to be signed and can pick it up in the library later on when it's convenient. Please just tell us your name and your tech number to reserve a copy. They are 2,200 yen each. Thank you very much for joining us again, and please welcome Dr. Story tonight. Thank you. Thank you. 1983, I'm invited by the Sundai Yobiko to come and talk about internationalization to their students. So this is actually my first speech. I was 30 years old at the time. You might be thinking, how come he didn't give a speech before he was 30? Very simple reason. I was terrified of public speaking and I ran away from every opportunity to speak in public. At this point, I got this invitation while I was studying at Georgie and I decided to do it and it was going to be in Japanese. So it was not only my first speech ever, it was my first speech in Japanese. So Miss Higashi, my tutor, helped me and wrote out the whole thing in Romaji, okay, in Japanese script. So I go to the Sunday Yobiko and I'm, students are there and I'm very nervous, I'm hot, pulse is racing, throat's very dry, knees are knocking, and I've got my text and I look down and I read the whole thing. It's a 25 minute speech and I finished in eight minutes, which is not a good idea. And that's how I started with public speaking. And now today I've done hundreds. I've done hundreds, over 450. And over that period of time, I've learned a lot. And as a president of Dale County Training Japan, we teach public speaking. We've been teaching public speaking since 1912. So we have a lot of expertise in the company about that. I've been trained to do that. So when we have classes, we have students, we see what people struggle with. I also observe very carefully public speeches that I see. And so I'm looking for what people are doing. And there tend to be some areas that are quite common that make it difficult for people to be successful as speakers. And I've tried to come up with what are the 13 most common problem areas that people have when they're doing public speaking. So that's what I was trying to cover tonight. And I'd like to thank Tokyo American Club for this opportunity. And this is a bit unique. We've got quite a number of members online. Welcome to our members who are joining us online. And we have members in the room. So this for me, I've done online and I've done in the room, but I've never done both at the same time as a hybrid. So very interesting to see how this turns out as a technical exercise. So first thing, you might have seen this, the speakers will start and they'll be at the podium and they start banging on the mic. Can you hear me at the back? Bang, bang, bang. 
I never understand how that could be possible. If we're going to be giving a talk, we need to get there way early and check the tech. I was here at six, and the tech we're using tonight is quite complex to do it live, online, and do it in the room to try and work out how we get things to fit together, make each other's um, interfaces work. And also just to check that the equipment is working, your own equipment is working. I teach at JMEC, some of you may know JMEC, I know some of you in the room know JMEC, the Japan Market Expansion Competition. I've been teaching there probably more than 10 years. So I'm actually due this weekend, I'll be teaching uh, again there. So I've got my prepared speech ready. I've got the slides ready, it's on a USB. They've got their laptop. I go to the event, I plug my USB in. I've got a Mac, they've got Windows. So suddenly all of my slides are all over the place. It doesn't match up. But you get there early and these things happen, you've got time. I finished to reset all those slides, I had two minutes and I got there early. If you got there just in time and you turn it on and suddenly your slides are a mess, you can't do anything about it. So check the mics are working, check the lights are working, check all the encryptments working, take that stress away from yourself because for many people, public speaking is stressful already, let alone trying to add the tech complexity to it. So who is in the audience tonight? Who is online? I need to know roughly who I'm talking to because if I don't, I might pitch it at a too complex level and people can't follow it, or it might be a too simple level and people are insulted. Now, why is he dumbing it down to us? You know, Where's the right level? And what's the interest of the group? And what's the complexion of the group? Age, gender, these types of things. And I was reminded of why this is important. There was a, it was actually, I was, might even be in this room actually. Uh, there was a senior executive, a lady senior executive, very big American multinational, huge company. And she was talking on the subject of personal branding. And there's probably about 50 people in the room. And you know, you exchange business cards. So you get to meet, get an idea of who's in the room, what companies they're with. Her talk was about personal branding inside a massive, big American company. That's the topic of the talk. And I was sitting there thinking, wow, I met quite a few people in this room. I don't think anybody in this room is working for a massive big American company like she does. So she's pitching to an audience that's not really relevant for the content of her talk because she didn't know who was in the room. So we've got to understand who are we talking to when we're preparing to have that in mind. How technical are they? Um, what are their interests? Male, female, as I say, age group, these types of things. So how complex is that? So Drew's organized the event. I contact Drew. Drew, who's coming? Who's online? Who's coming today? So I get an idea of who I'm talking to before I start talking. It's a very wise move to make because then your audience will appreciate that the level is at the right level for them. So if we think about planning, one of the things I noticed for a lot of people, planning means, right, get the slide deck together. Start from the slide deck. What slides have I got from previous presentations? Uh, what data have I got that I can bring into this, create new slides? And they start from the slide deck. Better way to do things is to start from designing it back to front. Start with the close. Start designing how you're going to finish the talk. Where will you go with this talk? What's the purpose of the talk? What is the key point of the talk? And try and get that down to one sentence, which is extremely tough to do that. But if you can really hone it down to just that one sentence, it'll be very clear what is the purpose of this talk. Once you've got that very clear in your own mind, then you think, okay, well, that's what I believe. Here's my key outcome. Here's the thing that I want to say, my purpose. How do I prove that? How do I prove to people what I'm saying is true? So I need to have some points, like mini chapters of the talk, and I need to have evidence. Evidence could be data, it could be uh, testimonials, it could be stories, it could be any number of things, statistics or whatever. But I need to know 
that I can prove what I'm going to say. And the last thing we're going to design actually will be the opening. And when we're designing the close, okay, that we do that first, we actually need two of those. We need one for this part of the talk, and then after Q&A, we'll have Q&A tonight, so I'll get to the end, I'll close it, then I'll say, now we have time for questions, Drew's going to coordinate that, we'll do the Q&A, and then we'll finish it there. I'll talk about Q&A in a moment, but two closes, and the last thing we design is the opening. Now, you know, I, I talking to Christian before, he's a very high-powered executive, he's a very busy man, he's a, in a very complex industry, and so his mind is full of what's happened today. He's had a lot of crises to deal with, a lot of staff issues to deal with. When he comes in here tonight, it's already full. So the opening has to be something that separates the workday from this presentation. It's got to take people's minds off their problems and get them in the room with you, concentrating on you. So I started with a story, a true story about my disastrous first public speech in 1983. So it's interesting to hear other people's failures and problems. We're attracted to that, to learn from them. So that story brings you into what I'm going to talk about and gets the day cut off, and now you're with me in the room. So your start has got to be a blockbuster because we've got a big enemy today, and that big enemy today is this thing. All of us as presenters are going to struggle with mobile phones in the hands of our participants or our guests in the, in the audience because they can escape so easily. We are now in the era of distraction. If people are not really gripped by what you're saying, then they will just whip out the phone under the table. Next thing you know, they're scrolling, looking at their email, going to the internet, checking their Facebook page, and they're gone from you, you've lost them. Now, that is a terrible, terrible, terrible result for a speaker. And as I say, I've been speaking for a long time now, but it's never been more difficult for us. So our openings have to be really able to cut through and grab people's attention because the phone is right there. So when I think about it, uh, we teach you high impact presentations. We've got some graduates in the room tonight too. Five years ago, if I asked people, how long does it take to, to really connect with someone? They used to say 10 minutes, 30 minutes. Today, it's very short. I'll talk about that a bit, in a, bit uh, a little bit later. But it means that short attention spans, we've got to grip them. So the opening is very, very critical. We've got to get that right. So start from the close, design the purpose. What's the key message? Work backwards. What's the point, points I need? What are the points I need? What is the evidence I need? Finally, we design the close, right? And so the opening, I should say. And then away we go. So if we think about uh, well, rehearsing too is another thing. People send a lot of energy on the slide deck. All the time, busy people, consumed, time poor. Actually, these phones, you know, this technology today, this is supposed to give us more time. But ironically, we are all time poor. So what happens is we shortcut everything. And we say, right, okay, I've only got a limited amount of time. I'll go to the slide deck. The problem with that is there's no rehearsal time. So to know how long your talk will take, the flow, the cadence, because often what you think will take a short amount of time takes longer. Things are not clear or you don't get the right flow to make the navigation easy for the audience. So rehearsal is a key point. Make all your mistakes in the rehearsal. And sometimes, even though you rehearse, things still go wrong. About five years ago, I was in Vietnam. I was there for an APAC Dale Carnegie convention. I was a final motivational speaker at the very end. Now, I had done probably 15 rehearsals for this. And I don't know if you know this, but if you're in a hotel room and you turn out all the lights, the windows become mirrors. So, I, you know, the night before I'm pontificating and gesturing and doing my whole talk, my final practice before the day. So you think, good to go. Yet, during that speech, all I had was a mic stand and me, so no podium, no, no notes. I got the order wrong. It should have been one, two, three, four, five in that order, but I got one, two, four, three. Even with all that rehearsal, sometimes you make mistakes. But 
the ability to recover is much stronger, even if you make a mistake, because you've done the rehearsal, because you know, oh, okay, I mixed up the order, I'll fix that and I'll keep going. So rehearsal is critical and we don't give it enough time. And if you can get feedback, it's very good. But with feedback, be very careful. The people around you will give you critique. Oh, that wasn't any good. Oh, that was terrible. Oh, you missed this. You, you messed that up. That wasn't good. You don't want that type of feedback. You want, what did I do that was good? How do I make it better? That's the only type of feedback you want because it's stressful enough to be a speaker and to get critique from people around you destroys your confidence. So you need to tell them how to give you feedback. That's very, very important. So we talk about uh, the, the, the planning. Uh, this is, sorry, with the, not the planning, with the um, personal branding. The thing that I found with public speaking is we judge you and we migrate that to your whole organization. So if I hear you speak and you're really great, mentally I say, wow, all those people over there are great. But if I hear someone speak and they're not good, and we hear that, we think, oh, they're not very good over there. So without knowing it, we are representing our personal brand and our professional brand when we speak. So we need to be well-trained, well-rehearsed, well-organized to create the right impression because this is our reputation. It's our reputation we're talking about here. And personal brand can make or break you in terms of how people regard your company and regard you. And as I said before, that lady was talking about personal brand. I had an interest, didn't, didn't actually fit at all to what I needed to know. But with personal brand, think about it. How will I project what I'm going to say? How will I engage the audience? How will I leave them with a strong message that they will think very well about me and I think very well about the message and the organization. It's a high stakes thing. <clears throat> I'm very interested about Clubhouse because Clubhouse is public speaking with no rehearsal, no prep. And yet people are putting their personal brands on Clubhouse with no safety net. They get on Clubhouse and they start talking. They don't have any points to talk about. They haven't worked out what I want to say. They're just going free, freestyle. And you can come across as someone rambling, incoherent, not very clever and not making any key points and destroy your reputation. But people are rushing into Clubhouse without thinking, this is a public presentation. This is your personal brand you're putting out there. So it looks like a simple thing. It's a dangerous thing. So if you're going on Clubhouse, make sure you're organized. So data is one of the things people think, well, look, I don't have to be a good public speaker. I've got terrific information. I've got all this great data. People are looking for the information. That's why they come to hear the, the, the talk. They're not coming to hear me. I don't have to be good. The problem with that is, if you are not connecting with people, they'll escape from you very quickly, straight to their phones, and they won't listen to the information. So imagine if I started my talk today, imagine I've got slide after slide of amazing data coming up, but this is how I present it. Well, um, um, I, I'm really excited. Um, um, uh, um, the data, oh, well, um, uh, 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 the data is uh, really good, good. And you um, um, will really, really um, um, benefit from, 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 from my data. If I speak like that, I've lost you, no matter how good the data is. If I talk like this, well, it's really exciting to be here to be both online, somewhere in the ether, the internet, and here in the room with the people today. I want to take you through 60 slides of very densely packed spreadsheet data up on a screen. They're gone. They're gone. So the data will not save you. And the thing with data is it's very hard to remember. Wrap it in a story. In the last 20 years, we've lost half of the population aged between 15 and 34. The last 20 years, half. In the next 20 years, we're going to, no, sorry, next 40 years, we're going to lose the other half again. So half and half again. What it means is over this next 40 years coming, 
that population keeps going down, companies are going to have trouble finding people. There's going to be a lack of young people. All right, so I'm talking about data. I'm talking about uh, 15 to 34 year olds halving the population, going to halve again over the next 40 years. But I'm talking it as a story about we will have trouble getting people in our companies. There won't be enough young people to go around. If I just give you that data, 50% down last 20 years, another 50% down next 40 years, it's too dry. So we've got to try and wrap it up into some sort of narrative, some sort of story that connects with our audience. Data is good, but people won't remember it because there'll be just too much. Try and find some interesting data and some interesting stories and bring that to the fore. And so if we think about energy too, the speaker's energy connects with the audience and gives them energy. If I started this talk today, very low energy. Well, thank you, Drew. It's really great to be here. I'm so excited to see uh, friends in the audience and online. I'm sure this is going to be very exciting when they're looking at it from around the world through to tax ether connection. It's so low key, it's so low energy, you start to lose energy to listen to me. So as a speaker, we've got to have more energy. We're not having a conversation. If we're sitting next to each other talking, that's one level of energy. You're not yelling at someone. But when you're up here, you've got to lift that energy above the normal conversational level. If we're dealing on a screen at home, Zoom meetings or WebEx meetings or team meetings or whatever it might be, the video sucks 20% of our energy. It just takes it straight down 20%. So we have to project 20% plus to get back to normal levels of energy. So think about that the next time you're having a Zoom meeting, drive your energy up 20% and you'll be at normal levels because now you're down by 20. Everyone in the media who deals on television, they know this, so they amp it up. And so as a speaker, you need to amp it up too. And particularly when you're making points, it's very common for people to make a key point and then just let it fade out like that. The sentence just dries at the end. So we've got to be very careful of that. We make a key point, we want to make sure it drives up at the end, with strength at the end, crescendo at the top. Don't let it fade out. I was at a talk uh, quite close to here. It wasn't here at TAC, but it was quite close. And a uh, young American woman was giving this talk. She was uh, quite well spoken, but a bit soft in the way she spoke. Didn't have a lot of energy, very much underdone. It was very hard to stick with her because she's not giving out any energy to keep you awake. Right? So these things become important. Project more than you would in a normal conversation, if it's online, at least 20%. And I'm probably doing maybe, I don't know, 30 to 40% more than I do normally in a conversation to give you the energy. So dress is important uh, in the sense of, depending on the circumstance, Japan tends to be a formal country, so you tend to be more dressed up than not. But if it was a, a tech industry event, I probably wouldn't be wearing a suit. Right? I wouldn't be casual, I'd be, I'd be like this, full battle dress. And we've got to make sure that what we're wearing is not competing with our face. This slide deck competes with our face. There's a lot going on up there. So we've got to make sure the face is really working well, but we don't want things like a really puffy, you know, pocket chief or for women, some big flowery scarf or something like that that is competing with our face because the face is a million watts more powerful than that slide deck. So we want people looking here. So dress for the occasion, but don't overdress. Right, I've got a very plain tie on, so it's not competing with my face. Right, I have a very subdued pocket chief, so it's not competing with my face. So we've got to think about these things because we want all the attention on us as the speaker. And I talked a little bit before about first impressions. As I said, five years ago, people used to say, oh, 30 minutes to make, you know, get a first impression of someone. 15 minutes, uh, five minutes. In our high impact presentation classes, when I ask people that, two or three seconds. That's what they're talking about. I judge people on first impression in the first two or three seconds. Think about that. People are so judgmental. They are so quick. We have such a small window. But what do we see speakers doing? They're over here at the, at the podium. They got the laptop. Uh, they're introduced, they go over, they put their head down, 
like under the bonnet of a car engine, and they're playing around with the laptop, they're looking down, they're getting the slide deck up, maybe the organization had their slides up and they've got to swap over, bring their slides up so they're here, doing all this stuff. That's their first few seconds. That's their first few seconds. In this case, I've got the advancer here, so I don't need to do that. If I wasn't using this anyway, I would get somebody else to set it up for me if we were swapping between Drew's slides and mine. So I could come straight up here and get straight into my talk with you and own those first few seconds of first impression. It's so, it's so critical and we can't lose that. So don't let anything get between you and those first few seconds with the audience to build that first strong impression. Then you can continue it along. But from now on, watch speakers how they start. Watch speakers how they start. See, I didn't thank TAC at the beginning. I didn't say, well, thank you very much, TAC, for organizing this tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Greg Story. I'm with Dale Carnegie. I didn't start like that. I went straight into the story because I've got to grab your attention. And then I said, you know, thank you very much to TAC. Uh, I'm Greg Story. I'm the president of Dale Carnegie. And I put that in there. So I changed the order to gather your attention those first vital seconds at the very, very beginning. And so uh, if we're thinking here, we're looking at Q&A, we're gonna do that in a moment. Uh, Q&A, Q&A can be extremely easy and not many hard questions or no questions, often that's the case in Japan, but often internal company Q&A, you know, after a presentation, a project presentation can be deadly. Sometimes, you may have had this experience, you have very ambitious colleagues. they got very sharp elbows. They're going to climb over you to get to the brass ring. And they take the advantage of question time to try and make you look stupid, to try and push you down. Or it might be an audience where someone totally disagrees, totally disagrees with the point you're making, and they want to go after you and tell you that you're wrong. And it's very aggressive. One of the problems with Q&A is, once you say, now we have time for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of Q&A, it's now a street fight, there's no rules. Generally speaking, up until the time you get to Q&A, the speaker is in control, 100% in control. People generally let you do your talk, they're waiting for Q&A. So when you get hit with a hard question in Q&A, often the speakers who look really good, they get to Q&A, they look really bad. They go from hero to zero, because they can't deal with the pressure of the questions. They don't know how to handle the questions. There's a few things here we need to know. The first thing is don't answer the questions straight away. Our first response straight out of our brain is usually the least well thought out contribution. We need a little bit of thinking time, not that much. So when we get a really hot question, have a little pause, then we'll make a little cushion between what they said and what we're going to say, a little cushion to soften the blow a bit. We might say something like, well, that is an important issue. And I'm glad we have a chance tonight to talk about that. That took about four seconds. With the pause, we're probably at about six seconds. So now my brain has gone from the first thing that was going to pop out of my mouth, because the distance from here to here is so close. I give a little bit of six second break. Now, if it's a hot question, for example, if it's town hall, and the staff, someone in the staff says, is it true that 10% of us are going to get fired this year because of COVID? And you're the CEO, you take that question. Now, we don't want to repeat the question. We want to paraphrase it. And it's always good to repeat the question because often in a big room, people can't hear the question. So you need to repeat the question so everyone can hear it. That's a good thing to do. But you don't repeat that question. You say, the question was 10% of the team are going to get fired this year. That's not going to help. Instead, we say the question was about staffing. So we take the opportunity to paraphrase the heat right out of that deadly question. The other thing too is if someone gives us a really tough question, when we answer, we look at them, give them about six seconds of eye contact, then we move on and we talk to the other people in the room. This is for any question, a hot question, not a hot question, doesn't matter. Don't just talk to the person who asked the question. Talk to the rest of the audience as you're giving your answer. But if it's a really toxic type of question, blank that person out. Give them no more eye contact. Don't even look at them. Because either they're a colleague who's trying to give you a hard time, you want to ignore them, or someone in the audience trying to be, hey, look at me, look at me, I ask a hard question. When you don't look at them, you take all the wind out of their sails, you take all their energy away, 
and you continue with who has the next question. So Q and A uh, is something that in Japan it's rare to get really tough questions, but inside companies it can happen. It's certainly certainly seen plenty of that inside companies when projects are being presented and uh, some fairly uh, fairly large amounts of blood going onto the carpet as a result because people didn't know how to handle a toxic question. And if you've got a toxic question tonight, bring it on. I'll show you how to deal with it. So uh, as far as PowerPoint goes, slides, this type of thing, it's a funny thing, isn't it? I was at a presentation. It was the uh, Economist Conference Network event. They had a sort of mad professor type of uh, Japanese uh, gentleman. He was a professor, genius, like sort of mad professor, genius professor. He had his own company, it was very high tech, a very smart guy, really smart guy. And yet, and yet, he put up this slide. It was like five colors. It was like four different fonts. It was like 15 slides worth of content on one slide. And you get a lot of that in Japan. If you go to a bookstore and you look at the covers of, of Japanese books, dense. If you go on the websites and you look at Japanese websites, dense. And so often you'll see in Japan, a lot of slides are just packed, packed with information. Remember, we're trying to get communication and persuasion going here, so we've got to be clear. If someone cannot get the point of your slide in two seconds, it's too complex. I was coaching an executive from a big tobacco company uh, recently, and I asked her to show me the slide she was going to use for a presentation to her boss uh, the next day. She put up the slides. Oh, my God. It was so dense. It was so packed. And I'm saying to her, well, that, that slide, break that into three. Well, if you're going to use that, bring up one portion, only one third, then gray it out, bring up the next portion, then gray that out, and then bring up the last portion, then bring up the whole thing if you want to. But too much information, it's too hard for us to absorb. And if there's too much information, it dilutes the power of the segments. So we want to make sure that it's a Zen-like experience rather than a Baroque experience, which is what a lot of Japanese slide decks are like. Keep it clean, keep it clear, keep it simple, and take one piece of information, put on one slide. People think, oh, but you know, it'll be faster, I put it on one slide. It's no faster. You take the same information, put it on three slides, the explanation takes the same amount of time, but it's much clearer. So really have a good look at your slide deck. Could people understand the key point in two seconds or not? If they can't, then you need to clean it up and slim it down to make it more clear for people. And so this is the thing I'm often asked about. Well, what do I do about fear? As I said, that first speech I gave, I can tell you, my knees were knocking, my hands were sweating, I was hot, my throat was dry. I was really, really nervous. These days, I'm not too bad. An audience like this, I'm comfortable. But if this was an audience of Dale Carnegie professionals who teach public speaking, and I had to give a speech to those people at a convention, I would be very nervous because I know I'm going to be judged by experts. So I would feel that nervousness. So some things you can do. First of all, realize it's a normal thing and it's chemistry. It's all about the chemistry. As soon as your brain has some sense of fear, it triggers adrenaline into your body. And that adrenaline does a couple of things. It starts to build a pulse rate up. Pulse rate goes up. When the pulse rate goes up, you heat up. That's why your palms start sweating, your throat feels a bit dry, you feel a bit hot. The other thing it does is it takes the blood out of the soft organs and moves them to where it's going to be needed for fight or flight, which is the thighs, arms, shoulders. So that queasy feeling you have in your stomach is just the blood moving to bigger muscle groups so you can fight or flight. So once you understand that, oh, this is why I'm feeling like this is because the chemicals are moving, you can't stop it. It will start. You can control it, though. For the, you know, the pulse rate, that type of thing, slow breathing. So deep breathing, lower diaphragm breathing from right down here is good. Slow. Don't go too hard because you'll get dizzy. You've got to take it very slowly. And gradually, you'll produce oxygen oxygen into the brain, you'll be clear, your pulse rate will start to slow down. If you're in a green room at the back or if there's a, a place people can't see you, like for example, if I was nervous about this talk, there's a room next door, uh, I asked for that to be opened up, 
I'd be pacing like crazy around that room before I came in here to burn off some of that excess energy I'm feeling, some of that tension, just burn it off. So by the time I walk in here, I'm calmed down. I've then dropped my breathing right down, so I'm good to go. So these are things we can think about with fear. Understand it's a natural thing. It's a chemical reaction. You can control it. The other thing too is people want you to succeed. They want you to give a good presentation. They're with you. They're not against you usually, right? So if you make a mistake, don't show it. Don't refer to it. I saw a speaker give a talk and she was with a slide deck, she'd obviously memorized the slide deck and the points. And she was going okay. She was blonde, she's attractive, she's tall, she's American, you know, very articulate, very sort of great presence, you know. She got about five minutes into it, and then she lost the memorization, synchronization with the deck, and she started to panic. And then suddenly, suddenly she said, oh, oh, I'm getting nervous. I have to take a deep breath. Well, she was going great guns. Her credibility went from here to here, just like that, straight down. And she regrouped and she started again, got about another five minutes, same thing again. After that, she had no credibility. So she wasn't controlling her nerves. She wasn't controlling her breathing. So breathing will help you to control your nerves. But if you make a mistake, right, she went off script, she should have just kept on going. Only you know what's in the script. And that situation in Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, 0.4 became earlier than 0.3. Only I knew that in the entire room. No one else knew that. So you can keep going with mistakes people won't know. So keep the mistakes to yourself and you'll do a lot better. And then, uh, you know, finally, this is going to be my, my last one here about engagement. Your Talk will have a number of chapters and a number of sections. Try in, in the sections to have some uh, activity. It could be getting people to raise their hands or answer questions, or it could be you're bringing your energy to it, or you're telling a story, or you're doing any number of things to create a little bit of more interest as we go along. This is a very simple talk to navigate because it's numbered. There are 13 slides and you know what's coming. So it's very easy for me to navigate that. And each one has a bracket and each one has a slightly different topic. So you've got to think, okay, audiences, if I, if I go too long in the story, I'll lose them. If I'm too short, it probably won't have enough depth. How long should the story be? This is where rehearsal is really key. And if I go off script and I'm, I'm, I mix it up, then keep it yourself, keep going. Uh, they won't know, just keep them engaged. And I'm, I'm looking at you. As I'm speaking, you notice I'm looking at you for about six seconds. Have you noticed that? I'm talking to each of you and I'm talking to you. I'm making eye contact directly with you as I'm talking to you. The impact of this is you feel it's just the two of us having a conversation. It's very personal. As opposed to I talk to everybody, and that means I engage nobody. Or I do two seconds. I go like sort of flitting, flitting, flitting eye contact like that. It's not effective because you don't have the engagement. I look at you. I talk to you for about six seconds, get into a story, then I pick it up, I pick up the next person at random. I'm not going one, two, three, four, five, six in order because it's predictable. It's got to be at random, right? It's like a baseball diamond. I've got the inner field here, I've got the outer field there, I've got the left field over here. Whoops, did I just click that? Sorry, let me come back one. Uh, okay. So, I've got the right field over here. This breaks up the audience, right? This breaks up the audience so that I can talk to each of you. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to have to get that to come back up again. Let me, can you just, uh, can I just bring that up? Uh, actually, I have my glasses on. Drew, can you just bring that back up as a whole slide again? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's the trouble with no glasses. I can't see. Yeah. And we need to go to the last one, unfortunately. Yeah, 13. There we go, good, thank you. So engaging your audience, you'll need to have brackets. You'll have to have something at each four or five minute bracket, change the pace or change the story or something. This is all visual, you notice I've got very few text words up there. It's all visual, it's easy to understand because I'm making the story with the visual as a support rather than the whole text is up there and that's the story, I'm the story. 
in this case, right? That's what we're looking at. So the thing I'd like to leave you with before we go into Q&A is persuasion power is a critical skill of anyone in business, whether you're selling to clients, whether you're leading a team, right? You need to be persuasive. There are certain things when you're giving presentations which work better than others. Things that people make common mistakes, you can eliminate those, you'll be doing a very professional presentation. Remember, this is your brand. This is your brand we're talking about here, your personal brand. You wanna make sure it's at a very high level and people think, oh, great, I wanna hear that person again. I'd like to know more about that person. I'd like to know more about that person's company. They look like the type of company we should be dealing with. So, Drew, we are gonna open it up for questions now. So we have got, how many minutes for questions, Drew? We've got 10? 10 minutes? Okay, we have 10 minutes for questions. And who has the first question? And Drew will bring you a microphone. So who has the first question? Yeah, Simon, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Greg, that was very engaging. Um, I have two questions. One is, who are your favorite public speakers? Mm -hmm. And my second question is, how do you deal with audience members who have become bored or distracted? Do you try to engage them even more or do you ignore them? Mm -hmm. What do you suggest? So the question was, who are my favorite public speakers? And the second part of the question was, what do you do with people who are obviously getting disengaged, got their phone out, they're scrolling, you've lost them, right? So regarding the first one, it's a difficult question because I guess when you're teaching public speaking, your expectations are so high. So I would say Joe Hart, who's the president of Dale Carnegie, he's a very, very polished public speaker, very good very good representative of the company. People often talk about Barack Obama. Yes, I like Barack Obama too. And uh, these days though, they're all using the prompters. You know, I'm not so keen on people using the prompters because I think if you're gonna give the speech, you should know what the speech is about. And uh, you don't need prompters, you don't need slides. Uh, Drew and I had a conversation beforehand. If the slides didn't work because of the setup here, I said, it doesn't matter, I don't need the slides. I can give these 13 points out of my head because it's easy for me to do that or I can have a note so I guess which comes next. So uh, I'm not crazy about the teleprompters, but so I like speakers who don't need them. And I think that's where Joe Hart's great. He's very good like that, I, I respect him. In terms of people who get disengaged, I stopped, I stopped speaking. So it's a pattern interrupt. They're busy with their phone or they're doing something and you stop speaking, they think, oh, it's over. And they wake up, you know. Or I might say, I might say, start using rhetorical questions. So what do you think the correct answer would be to who's the best public speaker in the world? Now, you don't know, is that a real question? I'm gonna require an answer from you or is it a rhetorical question? But you get the tension of the rhetorical question anyway. You think, oh, oh my God, I've got to give an answer. Or I might say, who has seen too much information packed onto a slide before at a presentation? And I model by raising my own arm what I want the people in the audience to do. So suddenly got people taking some physical action. Can only do that a couple of times though, because you start to, it gets very dull very quickly doing that. So stopping. Pattern interrupt, rhetorical questions. People think they've got to answer it. They think, oh, 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 I better answer this. And then things like physical action can be good. So I would be thinking of those three things for you, Simon, would work. Who has the next question? Well, this is such an easy audience. I love this. Yeah, please go ahead. So thank you for the opening story, very nice story. What was the next step when you felt comfortable with the public speaking? What was the change that make you feeling, okay, now I'm a good public speaker? Thank you. The question was about, uh, given my first story, which was a complete train wreck disaster, at what point did I become comfortable with public speaking? Now, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Did I learn from that near death experience as a public speaker. Did I say to myself, well, that was a total disaster. 
I'm going to have to do this more in my career in the future as I move up through the ranks. And I should go and get Dale Carnegie training, for example, or somebody else's training on public speaking. No, like most people, I did nothing. I just bumbled along for the next couple of years until I got to a stage in my career where I had to do quite a number of public speeches. That was really probably about 1992 when I became the consul for Australia in Nagoya. And uh, most of the speeches I was doing in those days were in Japanese. And so I was often invited to come and speak about Australia because, you know, having a consul consulate, it was a brand new consulate. I opened it in 92. That was a big deal. And so people uh, really looked for that. Did I lose something again? Yeah, there we go. And uh, they, they wanted me to speak. And so I got a lot of invitations and suddenly I got a repetition, which I found was very advantageous because when you do it more than once, it could be the same speech or similar speech a few times, the repetition helps you. And I, after that, after I'd done probably about 20, I started to get more comfortable, even in Japanese. And I always worked on the assumption that my Japanese is not perfect, but communication is not about linguistic purity. It's about getting the message across. So even if it's not quite right, if I say in Japanese, watakushi, ikimasu, Tokyo eki, Japanese speakers will go, ah, yeah, he means I'm going to Tokyo Station. They, they make the connection, even if it's wrong. So you can get away with a lot. And so I found that repetition is good. And I've had occasions where I've been able to do big venues, about 5,000 people. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get that many opportunities in Tokyo to do 5,000 people. But I always realized, oh, what I really want, I want 10 of these in a row. Every week, for 10 weeks in a row, I want 5,000 people audience and learn how to deal with such a big venue. Because when you do it very periodically, it's very hard to learn how to master that big scale, that big space. And that's where the repetition comes in. So my advice to anyone, and I know there's some people online tonight from Toastmasters, which I think is a great organization, gives people the repetition, gives you the chance, it's good. That's how you get better. And like me, first 30 years running away from public speaking, well, I finally got religion about it and I finally started doing it. And that changed everything, changed everything in terms of skill and the pleasure of it. At some point in time, after those first 20 or 30, I started to enjoy it. I started to enjoy it and I do enjoy it. I enjoy it now. So it's very comfortable for me. I like speaking with people. I like to get a message across, but it probably took me and I got probably 20 in a row pretty pretty quickly over probably that first year. You know, so that's quite a few in a couple of weeks. It happened like that. So grab the opportunity. Well, if you're worried, get the training. Get the training. Then you'll be ready to go and then look for the opportunities to speak. I'm always constantly, even now, I'm constantly looking for chances to speak so I can improve what I'm doing. And this is being videoed tonight so I can watch myself later. There'd be a record of this. I can look back and say, okay, I didn't like that part. I could have done this better. Um, maybe this didn't work so well, et cetera, et cetera. So I can keep improving. Who has the last question? Yeah, Robert. Mike's coming your way. Thank you, Greg, as always, for very interesting presentations. A lot to learn from you and keep learning, so thank you. My question is, um, what is your take on usage of jokes in presentations? I've seen, you know, for example, the former uh, ambassador from the UK to mm -hmm. Japan, very you know, eloquent and very good usage of jokes in his presentations. Mm -hmm. And what's your take on that? Yeah, the question is about telling jokes in presentations. The previous ambassador was absolute rock star with jokes. He was very good. Think about all the people who'd like to get into stand-up comedy. And think about the number of people who actually make it. Being a joke teller is a real skill. It's extremely difficult. Most people never make it as a stand-up comedian for that reason. So my advice is, unless you are someone who's naturally very good at it, and you've had a ability in telling jokes before you got into public speaking, I wouldn't go there. Now, I'll tell a story against myself. In my naivety, when I first started speaking, doing a lot of speaking in Japanese, I would create jokes in Japanese, thinking this will be funny. Bombed, completely bombed, nobody laughed. 
But I would say something and suddenly the audience would laugh. Ah, that's funny. I would write that down. That is funny for a Japanese audience. And over time, I collected a number of these things, which inadvertently were jokes for a Japanese audience, or funny at least, humorous at least. And I kept a record of those and I would use those in future talks. So yes, in Japanese, I did use jokes, but in English, I don't even go there because there are so many people in stand-up comedy who are so good. How can I compete with those people? I don't even try. So unless you're naturally good already, it's a very high risk, high risk. Now that particular ambassador was very good. And you can bet he'd been doing that for a very long time. And he'd built up a skill in that dimension. I really admired him for that. I was jealous of his joke telling ability, but I realized for myself, that's not something I'm going to do. So that's, I think it really depends on your natural ability in that area. It's very hard to learn how to become a joke teller, I think as an amateur, you know, as the professionals have trouble. So thank you very much for your attention tonight. I appreciate everyone coming out and thank you to everyone online for joining us. I hope this has been useful. So let me conclude with my final close, okay? We get to the end of the questions, you need that last close, right? Because someone could take this discussion off onto a tangent. And I'll just tell you a quick story how that works. I was giving a talk in Japanese to the Personal Managers Club. It's a very old established organization, HR basically. And we got to the questions and I said, you know, questions. And a lady, she looked about 70, 75, beautifully groomed, hair done beautifully, makeup, everything perfect, lovely little old lady, very cute. And she put up her hand and she said, I got a question. For the next 15 minutes, she gave her speech. She hijacked my entire talk. And what I was talking about was over here and she took it right over there. So it's always important at the end to come back and make sure your close is there after the Q&A in case someone does take it off tangent. And just for now for me to say, your personal brand, your professional brand are on show every time you get up to speak. So when you do that, make sure you've got the training, make sure you've done the rehearsal, make sure you've prepared properly, and you will be someone that people say, great, I wanna hear that person again. I'd like to know about that person and their company because they look like the sort of person that's a suitable match for my business. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Story, just to make this a truly hybrid experience, we did get one question online. Oh, good, okay good, good, good. Okay, I'll, I'll now take the online question. What was the question, Drew? We got one from Vipu. Are there any tips to be kept in mind when your presentation is being simultaneously translated in another language? Okay, so the question was, are there any tips to keep in mind when simul simultaneous translation is underway? In the introduction, Drew mentioned I uh, worked in the retail bank for Shinsei. And in those days, they had a permanent staff of about eight simultaneous interpreters because a lot of the execs in the bank who were foreigners didn't speak Japanese. And a lot of the Japanese uh, long-term credit bank people who'd come into Shinsei didn't speak very good English. And so I found the problem there was speed and idioms and humor. Coming back to your point before, Robert, about humor. Humor is difficult to translate. Idioms are difficult to translate. And when it's too fast, the translators have to reduce what you said down to a shadow of your main point. So it's good to talk in short bursts and have pauses. Now, if you have done consecutive translation, you know that if you keep talk, 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 then the person has to do the consecutive translation they can easily get lost. They can't remember what your points were. Simultaneous translators burn out every 15 minutes. They have to have a break because it's so intense. Anyone here, has anyone here done simultaneous translation, ever tried it? Yeah, it's not easy, is it? It's extremely wearing and tiring. And so you need to have a break. So try and make it easy on the interpreters by having short sentences and breaks in pauses. So they can remember what you said, they look at their notes, and then they can get the right translation. So uh, if you're doing consecutive, the same thing applies. There's a very famous Australian swimmer uh, whom uh, Ryan would know, uh, who, uh, boyhood hero of, of many of us, who came to Japan, uh, this is Lionel Rose, 
not, um, and he gave this talk, this is in Rise of Osaka, and it was consecutive, and he was so good with the consecutive. He was so good. He would speak, stop, interpret, would be, interpretation would be done, then he would pick up the thread again perfectly and move on. That's very hard. When you're doing consecutive, you talk and you stop, and they're doing the Japanese, then you forget, oh, what, what, what was I going to say next? You lose the thread. It takes a lot of concentration in consecutive to keep the thread of what you're saying, have the discipline to let the interpreter do their job, but for you to keep the track of what you're saying. So there's some key things for interpreters. So again, this is part of your professional toolkit as a speaker, if you're doing interpreting, to know that and to pace yourself accordingly. Because again, this is your personal brand on show here. So next time you're on Clubhouse, for example, remember, you are live and it's your brand out there with no safety net and good luck with that. So thank you again. Thank you.